think it's 405 here in California and I know it's 705 in the Philippines and 605 in Indonesia. Good morning everyone. We would like to welcome all our colleagues from Southeast Asia joining us today. Thank you. I know it's very early, but thank you for waking up to hear Dr. Songvi in our lecture. We would like to recognize past officers from CRO, former presidents Dr. Calaguas and Prof. Somjai are present. And the current president of CRO is um, also present today, Dr. Enrico Tanko. So welcome. I would start with what is Raya's contra cancer? Like, why are we doing this lectures? Raya's contra cancer is a nonprofit multi institutional project to improve cancer treatment in low resource areas around the globe through education and training, research, and collaboration. It was founded by Dr. Benjamin Lee. I think he will be joining us shortly, who is when he was still a medical student, but now he's a resident at UC San Francisco. So he's very, very instrumental in linking educators from the US to us in Asia. And how did RCC begin in Asia? It started when founder Dr. Lee and some of our Filipino colleagues met and we were thinking how, how can we augment radiation oncology education in the Philippines, you know? and the pandemic happened and it was timely and relevant to do this remote thing. And the first need that we needed, uh, that we sought to address was to do head and neck contouring. Okay, and due to the feed, good feedback from the Philippine curriculum, we want to expand to now first CROG and then FARO. So we'll be involving more and more people as we go along. Our speaker for today, is Dr. Farag Sangve, who is also our lead educator for our head and neck curriculum. Dr. Farag Sangve is a professor and clinical vice chair at UC San Diego, and his practice focuses on leukemia lymphoma, CNS tumors, and head and neck cancers. So without further ado, we welcome Dr. Sangve, who is also part Asian in this lineage, which I just learned off today. Part Malaysian. Yes, yeah, so he's one of us. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It is really my pleasure to join you all. Good morning, everyone. And I am really humbled to be in the presence of so many CROG faculty members and luminaries and feel a bit, bit like an imposter. So please jump in if I misspeak or if you want to add anything. So it's great to be back. We're approaching toward the end of our head and neck curriculum and we wanted to talk about some things or some nodal basins that we don't typically think of in head and neck, these levels um, eight through 10. And so we wanted to take this opportunity to talk about some of these, these nodal stations and talk about some of the malignancies where these nodal stations do come into play. And I hope for this to be very interactive and I have a, lot, a couple of cases that we're gonna go through together. So please anybody jump in on chat or in person as things come up. So we would like to remind everyone that this is a safe learning space. So if ever you have questions, you can put it in the chat. I'm Rochelle, I forgot to introduce myself. I graduated from residency in the Philippines and I'm doing fellowship here in Stanford and I will be moderating this lecture. So if you have any questions, just please type it or if you're shy to do it in the chat box, you can privately message me. Thank you. Great, thank you. So as we think of level eight nodes, so you know this nodal station is essentially it, you know, deals with the parotid gland. And so these are typically primarily intraparotid lymph nodes. So as we know that the parotid gland, in addition to being a salivary gland, is often a primary echelon of drainage for multiple malignancies in the head and neck. Um, and I've added preauricular um, lymph node basins because these don't typically fit in really in any other named nodal basin in terms of numerical staging, but really, you know, intraparotid, periparotid, and preauricular nodes really all fall kind of within the same geographic vicinity and often are involved in the same set of malignancies. So what malignancies do I think of when I think of patients having nodal disease? in the parotid glands. So, you know, obviously we all think of primary salivary gland cancers, you know, which can happen in, in, in 
both major and minor salivary glands and parotid gland being one of the major salivary gland cancers. So oftentimes these patients will present with a dominant, you know, primary tumor within the parotid and can have additional intraparotid nodes that are also involved with tumor. But the bulk of, you know, parotid malignancies really arise as, you know, really regional metastases from, from, non from skin cancers. You know, in the U.S., you know, the, the biggest skin cancer that causes nodal metastases, you know, it's generally yeah, squamous cell carcinoma is about 20% of all skin cancers here in the U.S. are squamous cell carcinomas. And if you look at squamous, squamous cell carcinomas as a whole, the likelihood of, you know, incidental nodal metastases, meaning metastases that you don't see on imaging or by clinical exam is on the order of 5%. But this is a, a, a very big average across the entire human you know, topographic skin anatomy. anatomy. Head neck sites neck tend, neck tend neck to be far more um, likely to have lymph node metastases. And there are a variety of risk factors within cutaneous malignancies, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck that can predispose you to a higher risk of having a nodal metastasis. So things I think of in that realm are grade of the squamous cell carcinoma. So, you know, poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinomas have a higher rate of nodal metastases. Certain locations within the head and neck predispose you to a higher risk of both local recurrence and regional metastases. And the highest region, what I think of tends to be what I call kind of the mask areas of your face. So typically forehead, temples, your nose, um, and your ears tend to be sites for skin cancers that can predispose you to, to regional nodal metastases. And finally, um, the last risk factor that I think is a big risk factor is particularly um, is immunosuppression. So patients, particularly who are um, solid organ transplant patients, have a much higher risk of nodal metastases from their skin cancers than patients who are otherwise immunocompetent. Other cutaneous malignancies you know, that predispose you to nodal metastases, obviously both Merkel cell carcinomas and melanomas, can certainly do that. So in terms of locations that drain right into the parotid gland, I've kind of noted here, you know, you can think of the parotid gland, you know, into two structures, kind of the deep lobe of the parotid gland and the superficial lobe of the parotid gland with the facial nerve being the, the junction between the deep and the superficial lobe. So in the deep lobe, typically the skin on the root of your nose, which is, you know, right between your, your eyebrows, your cheeks, your, the skin of your lateral eyelid and the skin around your lateral conjunctiva um, can drain into the deep lobe of the parotid gland. In terms of the superficial lobe of the parotid gland, it can be the anterior surface um, of the skin of your ear, your forehead, your, your temple, and also your, again, your lateral eyelid and lateral conjunctiva can, can drain in there. In addition to cutaneous malignancies, orbital malignancies can also drain into the parotid gland. And typically, if you think of it, the medial part of the orbit, the first echelon of nodal drainage is usually your retropharyngeal nodes and level two nodes. And the lateral parts of the orbits primarily drain into the parotid lymph node as the first echelon of lymph nodes. It's important to note that while these areas of your head and neck drain into the parotid, this is just the first stop. Once a tumor metastasizes into an intraparotid lymph node, the next echelon of drainage is usually the level 2A nodes, but then it can go literally into any of the regional nodes within that ipsilateral neck. So this becomes relevant in the sense when surgeons operate on these patients. So you have a skin cancer patient who fails in the parotid gland. The appropriate surgery for that patient is going to be both a parotidectomy and a modified radical um, lymph node dissection in those patients dissecting levels one through five. So just some boundaries for the, the level eight lymph nodes. So I've kind of put here from the Gregoire paper that I think we're all familiar with. You know, cranially, the parotid gland, you know, starts at the level of the, the zygomatic arch and caudally it goes down all the way, you know, to the angle of the mandible. In, in anteriorly, this typically parallels the masseter muscle and you have an accessory gland or the accessory tail of the parotid gland that basically parallels all the way to the anterior extent of the, of the masseter muscle. And posteriorly, this goes all the way to the anterior edge of the sternocleidomastoid. So you can see that the posterior edge of the parotid gland is intimately close with level 2A lymph nodes, essentially. And so you can see why this is the next, next stop where these, these tumors can metastasize. Laterally, you are all the way out to the skin and immediately up to the styloid process. 
So here's a picture um, showing you exactly this. So here you can see in yellow, this is that preauricular space that I was talking about. And then in the green, you see is the parotid gland right here. And so you can see that, you know, you can, you have the preauricular space that is basically extending, starting at the zygomatic arch, extending anterior to that parotid gland all the way, going up to the parotid gland posteriorly. And then as you come down in the, along your face, now that preauricular space is right along the masseter muscle, you know, la lateral to the masseter muscle here in this area. And then posteriorly, you have the parotid gland and you can see that the, you know, from the parotid gland, the level 2A nodes are the next stop. So it kind of basically goes in this semicircular loop in terms of nodal drainage for, for this area. So the next lymph nodes, level nine lymph nodes are buccofacial lymph nodes. And I'll be honest, this is a site that we don't typically think of very often, right? So buccofacial lymph nodes are rarely involved with cancers. The most common location of a primary tumor for uh, that put buccofacial lymph nodes at risk are going to be tumors that are really, really anterior part of your face. So within your sinonasal cavity, if you have a tumor that involves the anterior aspect of your nasal cavity, uh, and then your upper lip, those are probably the two anatomic sites that predispose you to buccofacial lymph node uh, drainage. Other areas, again, as I mentioned, you know, cutaneous malignancies and, and the parts of your face that drain, can drain into the buccofacial lymph nodes can be your forehead, the skin of your nose, and then the medial part of your conjunctiva and the medial part of your, of your eyelid can drain into the buccofacial nodes. If tumors go into the buccofacial nodes, the, the second echelon of nodal drainage typically um, are the submandibular nodes in these patients. So when you're gonna treat buccofacial lymph nodes, you have to make sure that you're then covering, you know, starting to cover one V nodes as that's the most likely area at risk. And I'm gonna show you a case of that in just a little bit. Again, here are the anatomic boundaries of buccofacial nodes. The, the cranial edge is typically right at the bottom of the, it's at the orbital floor. And then the caudal edge is right at the caudal edge of the mandible. Anteriorly, these nodes go all the way to the skin. And posteriorly, these, these, this area is basically anterior to the, the anterior edge of the masseter muscle. So meaning that th these lymph nodes lie immediately anterior to the preauricular lymph nodes. Laterally, they again go you know, up to the skin and medially the, the the bus bucinator muscle is, is, is the border for this. And here's what this looks like. So here you can see this patient, you know, on this axial slice, you can see this patient's nose. And essentially this premalar fat space that you can see very close to the inferior orbital fissure, this is essentially where facial nodes can then, as you come down inferiorly beneath the maxillary sinus and to the maxilla, they drain right here, you know, in, in this fat that is basically between the, between the maxilla and the masseter muscle and the mandible. So essentially it kind of goes in this inverted C that you can see in here. And then you can see, you know, as these drain further down below, you can go right from the buccal lymph nodes. The next echelon of drainage is going to be those 1B lymph nodes. You can see the submandibular gland right there and the space anterior to the submandibular gland is gonna be your level one B nodes. And after that, of course, this, this, the second echelon is also your level two A nodes, again, here in orange. So you can see when you're treating these patients, you, know, you really have to treat very extensive portions beyond what you would treat for a mucosal head and neck patient. And you're often treating these fat spaces very, very close to the skin surface, which can become an issue when you're trying to you know, expect and mitigate toxicities in these patients. Finally, the last set of lymph nodes are these level 10 lymph nodes that I'm gonna talk about. And these are essentially lymph nodes that sit behind your ear. And these are typically divided into 10A and 10B nodes. So 10A nodes are, you know, either you'll hear these words used interchangeably, retroauricular or postauricular. These lymph nodes are also sometimes called mastoid lymph nodes because adjacent to the mastoid, that fat that you see there is, is exactly this region. And and 10B lymph nodes are more posterior to these retroauricular or postauricular lymph nodes. Now you're going into the occipital fat. And so these are essentially in your posterior scalp. So if you look at the bottom of your, of your skull, 
it's essentially these lymph nodes that go, you know, right inferior to the base of your skull, from the from the base of your occiput, going all the way down, you know, essentially to the nape of your neck. In terms of head and neck sites that drain um, into level ten nodes, really primarily skin cancers. That that's what this is. So typically, you know, tumors that involve the posterior part of the ear. Or the parietal scalp or the occipital scalp. And if you have tumors that are into the mastoid process, so sometimes you'll see these very locally advanced primary tumors of the ear, not the skin of the ear, but the ear itself that are invading into the mastoid process, traveling along the facial nerve, these can sometimes then cause nodal metastases in, in these retroauricular lymph nodes. In terms of the second echelon of drainage for these level 10 nodes, the, the retroauricular lymph nodes drain into level two nodes. Uh, and typically these are gonna be oftentimes level two B. So behind the blood vessels, not anterior to the blood vessels. And then level 10 B nodes, again, drain into level two B and then level five A nodes. And so you can think of that as those your posterior cervical nodes. And when I think of these fields, I always describe this to my residents, think of it like a shawl. So think of it as, a, as like a man or a woman draping a shawl around their neck. It's, these are the fields exactly where that shawl or the scarf would lie on your neck, on the back end of your neck. So when you're contouring this, that's a good visual to have to make sure that you've covered all the appropriate nodal basins there. So same thing here in terms of anatomic boundaries. So as I talked about, you know, the cranial edge for level, for the, the posterior auricular nodes are gonna be right at the, the external auditory canal. And they're going to go all the way down to the, the tip of the ear or the tip of the mastoid. And in parallel, the occipital nodes are going to start right at that occipital prominence. And they're going to go all the way down to the top part of your level 5A nodes. And then you can see these other margins along that. But if you, if you think of somebody wearing a shawl or a scarf, you, you know, you'll have a good idea of where these level 10 nodes are going to be. And again, just showing you a picture right here. So what you see here in yellow is exactly where these posterior auricular lymph nodes lie. One thing that I do want to point out is that there are absolutely no anatomic barriers in the posterior occipital space. And so, you know, a well lateralized tumor, you're going to cover the ipsilateral side. But, you know, if the tumor is close to midline, you are then obligated to really treat all of the occipital space here and all of those occipital nodes in these patients. And what this is showing then is this, you know, that second echelon of drainage. So you can see here are these, you know, occipital nodes that are going right here into the level 5A nodes and then the level 2B nodes being right here. And the same thing being more inferiorly at the level of uh, the thyroid cartilage here, you can see same thing, the occipital space merging right into that level 5A lymph node space posterior to the sternocleidomastoid in these patients. I just wanted to do a quick detour. We're gonna talk a lot about skin, just to give you a sense of some skin anatomy. So we talked about the root of the nose and then we talked about the rest of the nose. So I mentioned that the root of the nose often can drain in to the parotid lymph nodes. And then the rest of the, the, rest of the nose can really drain in to the buccofacial nodes, oftentimes being one of the, the primary nodal echelons for these patients. And I'm going to show you a case of a patient with a big tumor in the nasal cavity in just a second. So I just wanted to point out some anatomy here. All right, so let's contour some, let's go through some cases and we can talk about the contouring and please stop me um, if any questions come up. I want to take some time going through these cases. So I have three cases for you today, you know, kind of highlighting exactly these level eight, nine, and 10 lymph nodes. We'll start with this first case. It's actually a patient of mine who I just saw, gosh, a couple of weeks ago. So an 85-year-old gentleman with history of multiple non-melanoma skin cancers that had been treated with either Mohs or with electrodesiccation and curatage. And his last Mohs excision was a skin cancer on his temple that was excised about a year ago. And now he presents with a metachronous isolated right parotid gland lymph node metastasis. So he underwent a right parotidectomy and a right modified radical lymph node dissection. Pathology showed essentially a 2.6 centimeter moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma in the right parotid gland. There was perineural invasion. There was no lymphovascular space invasion. And in, none of those right cervical nodes were involved. They, they did a um, right level one, two, five lymph node dissection here, and those were all negative. As you look at the staging for these cutaneous skin cancers, they essentially, the nodal staging essentially follows the same kind of 
N1 to N3 nodal staging that we're familiar with. So, you know, typically N1 lymph nodes are lymph nodes smaller than three centimeters. N2A, you know, somewhere between three and six centimeters on the ipsilateral side, a single node. N2B being multiple lymph nodes on the same side of the neck. And then N2C being multiple lymph nodes less than six centimeters on both sides of the neck. And then N3 being very large lymph nodes. There is a lot of interest, particularly in the non-melanoma skin cancer world for squamous cell carcinomas to even further stratify nodal drainage. And this is because, as I mentioned, majority of cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas, the first echelon of nodal drainage tends to be the parotid gland. And so there's a separate staging system called um, O'Brien staging system, which basically, you know, creates instead of TNM, it actually creates T. P and M. So the parotid has its own designation in the staging system. And patients who have parotid only metastases for these non melanoma skin cancers generally have a far more favorable prognosis than patients who have either parotid and cervical lymph node metastases or where it skips the parotid and goes right into the cervical lymph nodes. So here's some preoperative imaging. And so here you can see very nicely, you see this, you know. FDG avid intraparotid mass. And you can see this very nicely on CT. It's a well circumscribed lesion in the, I know, yeah. I know, yeah. I know. in the superficial lobe of the parotid gland right here. So, and you can see in comparison as to, you know, there's nothing there on the contralateral on the left side here in this patient. So, you know, I'll, I'll encourage you guys to write in the chat. I want to get a sense of, especially for the residents. So if this is your patient who has now had surgery and comes to you to see you for adjuvant radiotherapy, my first question for you is, would you treat instead of what will you treat? And then my next question, uh, please feel free to write in the chat box as to what you would treat. I'll give you a couple of minutes and I'll kind of take a look at the chat. Come on, don't be shy. Let's have someone type in. What, what, what would you treat for this patient? A tumor bed and the parotid gland. Okay, very good. I'm glad somebody soak up. Yes, yeah, so absolutely. So that's a great point. You, have, you wanna cover the tumor bed and the parotid gland. What else? Does anything about this patient's pathology or what I mentioned earlier make you want to treat anything else? How about that perineural invasion? Does, does that make you think of wanting to treat something else? All right, everyone's being shy. So I'll tell you the PNI does worry me. So as you know, the facial nerve is, you know, goes right in through the parotid gland. And so if somebody has especially, you know, some we try to then kind of discern whether the patient has focal PNI or extensive PNI. I think this patient definitely buys radiation to the path of the facial nerve, at least to the stylomastoid foramen. You know, if somebody has extensive PNI or if this were a different histology. So if this say this were not a metastatic skin cancer, but instead were an adenoid cystic carcinoma of the parotid gland, in those patients, I would actually then think of tracing the facial nerve even further going through zone two. So treating the, the labyrinthine segment going into the mastoid process and perhaps even going all the way to zone three. So going all the way to the internal auditory canal in those patients. But I think in this patient, given that this patient just has a cutaneous squamous cell skin ca cancer and really does not have other risk factors like immunosuppression and no other cervical lymph nodes, you know, certainly treating that path of the facial uh, to the stylomastic foramen seems reasonable. Uh, the other thing in these cutaneous malignancies is that, you know, if you've had a negative neck dissection, should you treat the neck? And this has been an interesting question that you know, in single institution series here in the US by University of Florida, and also then in Australia where there's a bit much higher prevalence of these cutaneous um, squamous cell carcinomas and regional neurometastases. 
And both of these experiences have shown that even in a node negative neck that you should cover the ipsilateral neck because there is a propensity for these patients to develop metachronous failures in that ipsilateral neck. So in this patient, um, this is what I decided to treat. So if you can see right here, so high risk, exactly as somebody mentioned, my high risk CTV was the resection bed with some margin, so a five millimeter anatomic margin. My intermediate risk CTV for this patient was the entire parotid gland. So the part of the gland that was taken out and part of the gland that was left behind. One thing to note about these surgeries today, you know, at most places across the world, you know, head and neck surgeons have gotten very good at facial nerve sparing surgery. So in the old days, when patients underwent a radical parotidectomy, they would routinely sacrifice the facial nerve so patients would have a complete facial nerve palsy on that ipsilateral side. Today, I think most head and neck surgeons will do their best to spare the nerve. They'll even sometimes strip the perineural sheath along the nerve, but try to preserve the nerve as much as possible. If they're not able to preserve the nerve, I think you know, there's a lot of interest by especially these facial plastic surgeons who will then come in and then put in a nerve graft. And the most common nerve graft is a sural nerve graft where they'll come in and basically cut portions of the nerve and then re-anastomose with these grafts. So something to kind of keep in mind as you're looking at the op reports. And finally, in that low risk CTV, I decided to add a little bit more generous margin around the preauricular nodes I did cover the post-auricular nodes and you'll see why. So these are the level 10A nodes. And then I covered the ipsilateral neck levels two to 5A. I made a conscious decision in this patient to skip 1B. He's 85 years old and I really wanted to avoid dose to the oral cavity in this patient as much as possible given his elderly age. And given that he was node negative, I took the chance. I'm taking a chance here, but I thought that this was a good calculated risk decision-making here to, to spare both the, the 1B and the 5B nodes. And so here, this is what this looks like. So let's go by these uh, axial slices. So you can see up here, um, you'll see different colors. The, the lightest color you see here is my low risk CTV. And then you see the pink right here is my intermediate risk CTV. And then as I come down further, the red is the pre-op GTV. So that's why this is going into air. I had fuse the pre-op PET CT with my, my treatment planning CT, and you can kind of get an anatomic idea of where this is. So again, starting up high, so you can see we're at the level of the zygoma. I'm treating that preauricular fat space here, um, and you can see the volumes right there. And then as you come a little bit lower, as you're coming along kind of the ear, just at the beginning of that external auditory canal, you can see that I've kind of now started drawing in my intermediate risk region with a more generous anteriorly and posteriorly. And so you can see covering this preauricular space. If this patient had a tumor that was in the preauricular space, I would have gone all the way to the zygoma here. In this patient, again, making the calculated decision to not do this, because as I pull this volume more anteriorly, one of the concerns that I'm going to have is that the lacrimal gland is going to be very close and I, I don't want to give this patient dry eyes. And so that's why you can see these volumes. And then posteriorly here, you can see that I'm contouring some fat space behind the ear to cover some of this pre post auricular or the retro auricular lymph node basin. So now coming down here and now what I wanted, I drew in here for you is to see that contralateral parotid gland. I will say that when you're drawing parotid beds and in, in, in the preauricular and postauricular space, it is very, very helpful, especially in the postoperative setting, to draw the contralateral intact parotid gland. So you can have a very good anatomic idea of where you are and how much you need to cover. So on this third CT, you can see now as we're getting close to that resection bed, I do have bolus right here in place because that's where I want to make sure that the skin is getting adequate dose. Again, you can see the preauricular space right here being covered. You can see the parotid bed being covered and you can see the postauricular space being covered. And you can see that I've otherwise contracted from skin and I'm trying to respect the anatomic boundaries here, not going into the infratemporal fossa and not going into the mastoid process. As I come here further down at the level of the maxillary sinus, now you can see that I'm covering the parotid bed and now I'm covering not just the superficial lobe of the parotid bed, but going around to cover that deep lobe of the parotid bed. And what I'm also capturing right here 
Here you see the mastoid process right here. Here you see the styloid process right there. And this space right in between the mastoid and the styloid is the stylomastoid foramen where that facial nerve exits out of. So I'm making sure that I have a generous margin there on that facial nerve. So again, just coming down further, now we're right in parotid territory. You can see that beautiful parotid gland. And this guy, I will say, so, you know, for my non-medical speak, I often will talk about, you know, salivary gland sparing is very easy when people have juicy parotid glands, right? Big volume parotid glands. It's very hard when people have very atrophic small parotid glands. And this gentleman has a very juicy contralateral parotid gland. You can see that's quite, quite big. And you can see here, so again, you can see my volumes right here. So in this, this very light faint pink, here's that resection bed now where I'm going, that that's my high risk CTV, where I'm gonna give 66 gray. The pink is where I'm gonna give 60 gray. And then this, this orangey line here is where I'm giving you know 54 gray. So you can kind of get this idea of how this, these sit here. And then you can see the ear here. I'm actually going to draw in both the external ear and the auditory canal and have them be avoidance structures. It's gonna be really hard to avoid the external auditory canal in this patient, but I am hoping that I can at least spare some portion of the ear itself so the patient doesn't get a brisk desquamation on the ear. And now coming in inferiorly, you can see, again, covering the superficial parotid gland. And you can see that this is a very real world case, right? 85 year old guy with a lot of dental artifact from his metallic fillings in his teeth. And again, this is why it's so helpful to draw that contralateral parotid gland. So I have a good anatomic idea of what I need to cover on this ipsilateral side. So now I'm coming into that lymph node basin. Yes. One of the questions is like, what RT technique are you using for this patient? Is it IMRT? That's a great question. So achieve your doses. Yes. So the high risk dose is 66 gray because it was what I'm going to give there. The intermediate dose is going to be 60 gray. And then the low risk dose here is going to be 54 gray. So I'm basically going to do this in 33 fractions. I am going to use IMRT, but this is a great question. Do you need to use IMRT? Absolutely not. Right. IMRT will help me. So where IMRT will help me in this particular patient really is going to be sparing that mandible that is so proximally close to where I'm irradiating. That's the only thing that it's really going to help me spare very well. So I'll, I'll ask you guys, I'm going to ask you the question. If you, if you can't use IMRT, what would be your technique? How would you treat this? And I'll give you a hint before IMRT, I used to treat this like this all the time. There are two ways to treat this with 3D conformal radiotherapy. So does anybody want to give me the two classic ways of how you would treat this? Please introduce yourself and your institution before giving an answer so we know who you are. And as Rochelle mentioned, please don't be shy. This is a very safe space. We're all here to learn from mm -hmm. each other. Okay, we will go for ob oblique. 3D conformal radiotherapy. Very good. So exactly, and a wedge pair, two oblique beams. So a beam coming in this way and a beam coming in that way would be completely appropriate to treat this. So does anybody want to tell me, uh, and I'm going to maybe go back. Oh, let me come back to the slide. What is the co cost of doing that? What beside, I already gave you one answer that you, you would give some dose to the mandible, but what other structure you have to be cognizant of? And let me, okay, yeah, let me go back here. So if you're using a wedge pair here, look at the cat, look at especially the first two axial slices here. What structure you need to be cognizant of in terms of the radiation dose with a wedge pair or an oblique field? Again, so look at this one. If you're Very giving heavy. radiation here, what structure Very immediately heavy. next to it? The back exit dose of the lateral eye. I missed that. Where, where would you worry about that exit dose? Where? The exit dose to the contralateral globe from the posterior oblique beam. Good. So the globe, it's very good. And what else? What's right behind the globe? Temporal lobe, Mei Chen. Mei Chen. Mei Chen. Very good. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> exactly that. The, that's, that would be the cost, right? So exactly. So 
if you do 3D conformal radiotherapy, the three organs where you would give a little bit more dose would be the globe, the temporal lobe, and the mandible. So mm -hmm. what other 3D conformal technique could you use? I know your attendings know this. Um, <laughs> so if you if you think of beyond photons, what other modality do you have? I need to ask my residents. My residents is quite silent today, so I'm the attending. Oh, <laughs> can, okay. I, can I answer instead of them? <laughs> Mixed beam, okay. Mixed beam, very good. So I don't know who said that, but that's exactly right, right? So you can use exactly a single mixed beam. So you can use, and we used to do this all the time, use a combination of photon and electrons um, to treat these parotid malignancies. So you could weigh the, the, so which beam would you weigh higher? Electrons or, pro, or photons? What would be more weight? Yeah, photon. Yeah. My, my, yeah. Yeah, because it's quite located deep. In it's located the, deep, so yeah. So you basically, you know, so we used to do it, these three to two weightings or or six to four weightings, essentially, you know, or six, I mean, sorry, three to two weightings or four to, four to one weightings of photon electrons, exactly. So you can do that and treat these. So you absolutely, so to answer that question, you, you don't have to do IMRT. You can certainly do that. Use 3D conformal, especially if you're not treating the lymph nodes. Honestly, it's very tempting, you know, if, um, to consider 3D conformal in these patients. In this patient, I, I'm electing to treat the lymph nodes. So as you come down further, now you can see that I'm treating levels 2A through levels 5A in this patient. But what I'm very generously covering, what I want you to kind of get a sense of, is exactly this preauricular periparotid space. So this is something very different than what you're going to cover for most mucosal malignancies, you know, for your patients. And again, you can see here that, you know, I, I again, drew in the gland to have a very good sense of where the cranial edge of the, my gland would have been on this side and where my caudal edge of the gland would have been this side. So this is the caudal edge of that gland right here for this patient. And Doctor then here Sandy. coming in the neck and you can see here the very standard kind of feels of the neck. But again, covering that you know, giving some margin on that resection bed. If we go back up, like we have another question, like would you be concerned with cochlea and- Oh, that's a great question. So hearing yeah, side effects? Here you go. So here's, right, your cochlea is gonna be somewhere in here. And so with IMRT, not really, I would not be concerned with the cochlea dose. If I were doing 3D conformal, absolutely, depending on the angles of my oblique fields, I may have a hot spot right in the cochlea and I'd be concerned about that. But no, but but IMRT, you can spare that well. And that would certainly be an organ at risk that I would draw in here to to avoid. Okay. okay. All right. And then one last question. Oh yeah, go ahead. Before we go to the next case. So one of your residents asked if there's still a need to follow cranial nerves for PNI, even if it's squamous. Or yeah, so, so we say it's treated question. similarly like adenoid cystic? Yeah, I, I will say that I think in cutaneous malignancies have a pretty, especially once you start seeing regional. So the two patterns of failure that you see in skin cancers out that are local is perineural and, and regional nodal metastases. So once patient has one or the other, I'm very concerned about the other happening. So in this patient, in the setting that the patient had a regional nodal failure and has extensive PNI and the facial nerve is right there, in this patient, absolutely, I would trace that facial nerve to, to at least the stylomastoid foramen. But that, so yes, in this patient, I, I'd be worried about that. Shall we have one question? Does size matter for the lymph node? Absolutely, what a great question. So I didn't go over because of time, but if you were to look at that P staging, the parotid staging, it also comes in P1, P2, and P3. So P1 is less than three centimeters, P2 is three to six centimeters, and P3 is greater than six centimeters. And, the, and that the size of the intraparotid lymphoid metastasis absolutely has bearing on in terms of risk of further failure. And the last thing that I didn't mention for these patients, you know, if you, when, once a patient has a, a regional metastasis from a skin cancer, if you just do surgery, the, the risk of relapse is extremely high, even in a you know, completely, really ex exquisite lymph node dissection, negative margins, 
no LVSI, no external extension, that risk of recurrence is on the order of 40 to 60%. And so adjuvant radiation is extremely important in these patients, even in the low risk patients, uh, because you will improve their five-year disease-free survival from 20 to 30% with surgery alone to about 70% with, with surgery and radiation. All right, let's talk about this next case. This is the hardest case, uh, but a very interesting case. So this is again, a patient of mine, 69 years old with a very locally advanced um, cancer of the nasal cavity. And I described here what it involved. It involved, you know, both it involved the nasal cavity, it extended into the nasal soft tissues, went down into the columella and the upper lip, and then posteriorly went into the maxilla and in the anterior surface of the hard palate. The patient underwent a PET scan and the PET scan showed uptake in bilateral level 1B lymph nodes. And then this patient got radical surgery, which was a total rhinectomy, partial maxillectomy, resection of the upper lip, resection essentially of the face around it, and bilateral levels 1 through 4 lymph node dissection. And this is what the final pathology showed. Very large tumor. So as you can see, almost 7.5 centimeter tumor, you know, positive PNI, positive LVSI, negative margins. And this patient had bilateral level one lymph node involvement. So had, you can see both sides, multiple lymph nodes positive in the level one nodal station. So the, and these were level one B nodes with extra nodal extension. And this is what the pre-op imaging looks like. So you can see this pre-op imaging here. Um, on, I'm showing you a PET scan. So here you can see this Sagittal view, a big bulky tumor essentially involving the anterior nose going into the upper lip and you can kind of get a good sense of that. And here on the axial, you can see, you know, involving the anterior nasal cavity, involving those prenasal soft tissues. And then more inferiorly, you can see that this is involving his entire upper lip. So very locally advanced neglected squamous cell carcinoma. Okay. So then this patient came in for a CT simulation and I gave this patient contrast. This patient is um, edentulous, which made my job a little bit easier. So tell me, what do you see? Somebody, what does that arrow show you right there? And compare the right side to the left. A facial node. You got it. So exactly. So here, this is a perfect example of what a buccal node looks like. <laughs> and so here's this patient with this buccal facial node. Exactly right. So this was not on the preoperative imaging, and and now all of a sudden, you know, patient is about four weeks out post-op, and you can see the patient's failed in a, in a buccal facial node right here. So. What will you treat? For the sake of time, I'm not, this is a hard case. So I'll, I'll tell you this, this, this is even something that I don't see very often, but I can kind of give you this rationale and we can kind of go through this step by step. So you can see here, now I have a gross node. I have a level nine gross lymph node. So obviously I'm going to take that lymph node to 70 gray. I added an additional margin around that lymph node for the next dose cloud where I gave it 66 gray. And then I covered the bilateral level 1A and 1B nodes. So this patient had bilateral 1B nodes with extra nodal extension. So, so I, I treated that area to 66 gray. And then this is the, the hard part, right? So I not only have to now irradiate the primary resection bed, I mentioned to you earlier, this patient had extensive perineural invasion. And this part of the face is, is really the primary, the branches are going to be really V2 in this patient. So the, the maxillary branch of the, of the trigeminal nerve. And so in this patient, you know, we covered that whatever was left behind of his nasal cavity. And a, if you think of it in 3D, a very nice volume around that resection cavity, which would include ethmoid sinus, maxillary sinus, and then we wanted to cover the path of the facial, uh, path of the trigeminal nerve here. So the teravopalatine fossa and the maxilla in this patient. In terms of the intermediate nodal basins, you know, the rest of the buccofacial lymph nodes, level two and level three nodes. And then in my lowest dose, you know, elective basins, basically treating the path of the V2 
up to the cavernous sinus and Meckel's cave. So kind of treating zone two for, for this nerve. And then essentially covering all the lymph nodes on both sides of the neck. So you can see bilateral retropharyngeal nodes, retrostyloid nodes, and level four nodes. Given how high risk this patient's disease was, this patient actually was then, you know, got concurrent chemotherapy. So got high dose cisplatin, you know, what we typically use for a lot of our squamous cell, you know, mucosal malignancies. And so let's go through some contouring. So again, what you see here in green is the lowest dose cloud. So this is the 54 gray dose cloud. And for this one, I put the PTVs on so you can kind of get a sense of what I'm covering here. So you can see, you know, this is covering very generously. So because once you start, when, once tumors kind of grow into the nasal cavity, there again, the point I want to make here is that there are absolutely no anatomic barriers here. So they can start spreading to really all the paranasal sinuses. So you can see here covering, you know, all the way to the frontal sinus, you know, and then now coming down here, covering the ethmoid sinus where I, this is getting 60 gray right here between the orbits. You can see posteriorly covering the, the cavernous sinuses bilaterally, and, and I, you know, I covered Meckel's cave as well. As you come down more inferiorly, you can see here's this defect. His no, this guy had no nose, so he had a big rhinectomy defect. And the plan for reconstruction was to delay. So once we found that buccofacial node, we knew that this guy needed to get to adjuvant therapy sooner than later. So all reconstruction was delayed um, for six months until after finishing his definitive, finishing his, you know, cancer therapies. And so here now you can see, you know, not covering the, the nasal cavity defect right here, the very top of the nasal cavity, covering bilateral maxillary sinuses, covering that path of V2, which comes from the infraorbital fissure, it go, going along the lateral aspect of the maxillary sinus and coming into the pterygopalatine fossa right here. So again, kind of showing you some examples of that. So covering all of this here. And as you come more inferiorly, now you can start seeing. So here's this bolus E type material that I put into the nasal cavity. So there would be something to kind of fill in. It is not perfect, you can see, but down here, it does a great job of filling in down here. But now you can see we're starting to get into the lymph nodes. So covering those retrostyloid lymph nodes and lateral retropharyngeal nodes here. And then here covering all of that premalar soft tissue. So starting to cover those facial nodes. And now, you know, as you get here at the bottom of the maxillary sinus and to the top of that max, max, partial maxilla that's left behind, you can see now we're covering those buccofacial nodes. So this is what these buccofacial fields look like. And then you can see in red here is where I'm giving 66 gray. It's very clear. You'll soon see that lymph node coming into play here. So here's some very nice contour buccal facial nodes right here. And then here you can see the, the level two nodes coming here more posteriorly. Did somebody have a question? All right. So here more inferiorly, again, you can see these buccal facial fields. So you can again see 70 gray, 66 gray, 60 gray, and you can nicely see these buccofacial fields. And because this patient had level 1B involvement, you know, with external extension, that's also going to get 66 gray, and you, you'll see this going down. And again, coming down here. So you can see when you're covering these buccofacial nodes, you know, it's very, very tricky to spare the mandible because, you know, you're going to be treating all of that fat space you know, essentially lateral to the mandible against the skin. And so you can see what these contours look like here. And you can see why buccofacial lymph nodes, that if you have cancer in a buccofacial lymph node, the next echelon of nodal drainage, as I mentioned earlier, is going to be level 1B. And you can see that connection right there, right? So it's, it's, you can see why this, that's the next echelon right there. And then as you kind of come down to the lower neck, these volumes are now familiar to you. You can see we're covering 1B, 1A, and then level two nodes here. And then same thing now covering level 1A, all the submental nodes. And then covering, you can see here, level two, three nodes. And then, you know, coming down to the super cloud, treating these nodes down in the super cloud. And giving you a coronal view, I just wanted to show you what these buccofacial contours and level one contours look like. So you can see, um, here's that node. Here's that buccofacial node here. And you can see what the contours around there look like. So think of this basically essentially the area between your mandible and your lateral skin 
basically below the orbit in by the maxillary sinuses. So any questions about this case? Okay. Well, let's end with our last case. Let me go back. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. The last case, so this is illustrating those occipital nodes. So this is actually a patient, another patient. So you can see you're seeing a theme here, old people with skin cancer. 86 year old gentleman with again, history of multiple non-melanoma skin cancers who presented with a lesion on the right occipital scalp. With, this was biopsied, came back as squamous cell carcinoma. On staging, there was no underlying involvement of the occipital skull. He undergoes a wide local excision. And during that time, they see a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. It's adherent to the underlying musculature, but there's no bone involvement. The margins of resection were negative. There was no lymphovascular space invasion and no perineural invasion. I saw this gentleman earlier, actually late last year, right around the holidays. And this gentleman was 86 and said, you know, I take my entire family to Hawaii every year for the winter, for, for the winter holidays. And I don't want to miss that tradition. I'm 86 years old. And so even though this was going to be outside of his, of his six-week post-operative window, I agreed to let him do this. And unfortunately, even before he went on his holiday, he presented with a recurrence right within six weeks of surgery in the resection bed. This was resected again. On the PET CT, all you saw was tumor in the resection bed. There was no cervical lymph nodes. It was re-resected. And now we had to forego his vacation plans and he started radiation right there. So I wanted to show you what the preoperative, this is, that, this is after the first surgery, but before the second surgery when he recurred. And you can see here, this is right where he recurred. So you can see on this axial view, right you know, in this posterior occipital space, this is right behind the mastoid process you can see here. This other uptake you see is, is, is just brain, okay? It's just cerebellum. And then here you can see both on coronal and sagittal views, you can get an idea of where this is really far behind below the occiput, as we mentioned, occipital nodes right below the occiput of, the, of your skull. So again, what will you treat for this patient? So as we talked about, you know, obviously the resection bed and you want to give generous margins. And I will tell you that I drew these volumes and this patient just ever so happens to be, he's a billionaire. And so that he's very connected. And so the surgeon was exquisitely involved more so than any other patient on this patient's case. So, you know, rarely do our surgeons ever come and check my volumes, but this surgeon actually came in to check my radiation treatment volumes and actually made them more generous because he was so worried about this patient, given that he had disease adherent to the underlying musculature of the posterior neck. He actually wanted me to make all my volumes bigger. In terms of the elective volumes in this patient, obviously treating the, the retroauricular and the occipital lymph node basins. And then, as I mentioned earlier, if you think of this as a shawl or a scarf around your neck, the next echelon of drainage often is level 2B nodes and level 5A nodes. And then finally, I added this extra vol volume, even giving more margin going all the way to the musculature of the cervical spine in this patient. And so this is what this looked like. So again, you can see there's some bolus here. You can see on the sagittal view, you know, the three different, so what you see in orange here is where his, his initial tumor and the recurrent tumor was. Here in that, you know, peach color, you see the 66 gray volume. In red, you're seeing the 60 gray volume. And then in, in this light green, you're seeing the 54 gray volume. And these are my PTVs. So that's why you see this going into the skull. But these are my PTVs with some margin here. And so now showing you what this looks like cranially. So you can see, you know, treating that occipital scalp here. And you can see that. So I'm treating, so up here are those post-auricular or retro-auricular lymph nodes, you know, right behind the earlobe. And then more posteriorly, you know, going all the way to the occiput is the occipital lymph nodes. And you can see that, you know, I'm going, you know, this tumor was fairly lateralized. So I made the decision just to treat ipsilaterally in this patient. And you can kind of get a sense of these volumes here. 
And you can see these volumes again. So now you can see down here going and treating both the level five nodes and the level two B nodes in this patient. And again, this patient is, you know, in his late eighties and I was very cognizant of wanting to spare, you know, areas where I knew that the likelihood of nodal failure was low. Remember he was node negative outside of that occipital mass. And so, you know, being very conscientious to not treat level 2A or 1B in this patient, given the location of the primary tumor, but covering those posterior nodes very well. So here you can see, you know, again, level three, and then really that level 5A lymph nodes right here. So those are my three cases. And I'm going to end by just some pearls about skin cancer, because, you know, when you're thinking of these, especially level eight and level 10 nodes, it's really skin cancers that cause these most of the time. A couple of things. Skin cancers have a notoriously variable lymphatic drainage. The location of the skin cancer can guide you, but it's not always perfect. You will find that your treatment volumes are much bigger, even if you're do just oftentimes doing ipsilateral you know, resection bed and neck radiation, they're going to be far bigger than anything you do for your mucosal head and neck cancers. And lastly, being aware that once skin cancers start invading into the structure underneath it, it can, these, these can sometimes change lymphatic drainage and actually increase the risk of nodal failure. So for instance, a skin cancer of the ear has, you know, has a risk of nodal failure, but if the tumor actually invades the cartilage of the ear, it has a much higher risk of nodal failure. And so I'm not going to go over all of these, but I wanted to just kind of leave you with some pearls. This is based on our extensive, you know, in Southern California, I treat a lot of skin cancers. So this is something that I do a lot. Again, not for you to memorize, but really to have a resource. If you ever see skin cancers, have a resource of what nodal basins at minimum you should think of covering. So I've kind of outlined these for you, starting from, you know, really all aspects of the face um, for your patients. So you can take a look at your leisure and please email me if you have any questions. All right. Thank you so much. I'll, I know we're a little bit over time, so I'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much for that wonderful lecture, Dr. Songvi. So we all know now the importance of controlling levels eight to 10 and their drainage and how to contour them. And, and this treatment can not necessarily be delivered just by IMRT. You can use other modalities too. Any other questions? Oh, and here's my, oh, I, I have my email on there. Here, I'm gonna put that back up. And this slide um, I have will be uploaded and then emailed for everyone's copy. So please do not forget, I know we didn't have time to introduce ourselves and there's a lot of us. We have really good attendance. Thank you, CROG, for this. Thank Rachel, you, RCC. Can I have a comment? Rachel, can, may I have yes, a comment? Paul. Yes. I oh, just want to thank Professor Sangvi for a very enjoyable lecture. In fact, I was so tempted to give my answers regarding the, the you know, <laughs> the, 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 I used to do that, you know, the wedge pairs, yeah. you know, the mixed beams with electron and photon. So thank you for bringing it up because here in Southeast Asia, we have, we have a wide range, you know, we have the highest uh, form of um, advanced technologies, though we still have centers that are still using 2D, still don't have IMRT capability, just fewer though, but it's good to bring up the older technologies and thank you very much. It's a very enlightening lecture and I'm sure a lot, a lot of the residents, including us, past residency, also learned a lot from your lecture. Thank you so much, Professor. My Sam. pleasure. Thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate you being there. Uh, just a comment, Dr. Tanko here. I'd like to, to thank the RPC team. This was really a very, very good, actually excellent lecture. And we're hoping that in the future, we can continue our collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tango. Dr. Tango is the current president of Southeast Asia Radiation Oncology Group. Dr. Tango, thank you so much for joining. We, we hope to see you in person someday after the pandemic. Definitely, thank you. And uh, Parag, I, I just wanted to thank you again uh, so much for this enjoyable lecture. You're really making learning fun. 
and collaborative. And I think it's a wonderful contribution to our field of radiation oncology. Dr. Tongo and Dr. Calaguas, thank you so much for helping spread this. We, we want to spread RCC. <laughs> nice and to see you again, Dr. Lee. You're doing a great job. Now from the Philippines, you're expanding to Sierra and Faro is also waiting for you. You have more work ahead of you. <laughs> Please Good. welcome Dr. Lee, everyone. He's the founder of RCC, for which our lecture is possible. Well, I'm, I'm learning with everyone. I, I, I think this is a great resource. We'll make the slides available. If it's agreeable with you, Dr. Calaguas and Dr. Tongo, we'll share the slides with you so you can share them with your respective centers. And, you know, just I, I think this covered vignettes of so many cases that are so rare, but are so important to know what to, what's the right thing to do. And so if I ever come across one of these cases, I think I'll be going back and, and reviewing these slides in the video. So thank you for the resource. And thank you to Richelle. Yeah, I wanna give a big shout out to both Ben and Richelle. I mean, they, they have done an amazing job of- Including really Dr. Jackson Flores also. He's the, yeah. done the groundwork yeah. here in, in Seattle for both of them. Thank you. Thank you.